Hello, and welcome to another Understanding Deep Learning lecture. Today we have here joining us Stanislav Fort. Uh, Stanislav Fort is a PhD student at Stanford University. His research focuses on developing scientific understanding of deep learning and on applications of machine learning and artificial intelligence in physics sciences in domains like spanning uh, from X-ray astrophysics to quantum computing. Stanislav spent a year as a Google AI resident where he worked on deep learning theories and their applications in collaboration with other colleagues from Google Brain and DeepMind. He received his bachelor's and master's degrees in physics at Trinity College, University of Cambridge, and a master's degree at Stanford University. Stanislav, be welcome. Uh, have a great lecture. Take it away, please. Thank you very much for the introduction. Uh, is everything working fine? Do you see my screen, uh, my face, everything? Yeah, yeah, it's perfect. Perfect. OK, thank you very much uh, again uh, for the introduction. And thank you for organizing this amazing uh, seminar on deep learning understanding. I was looking at a lineup of speakers you have, and it's a great honor uh, to be among them. Uh, so thank you again. My lecture today will be on uh, neural network loss landscapes and how they look like in high dimensions, and if we can see and say anything concrete about them, especially on the boundary between the theory and practice, so whether we can say something theoretical and then link it to practical applications uh, in deep learning. And uh, just uh, maybe to quickly reiterate, my name is Stanislav Fort, and I'm a PhD student at Stanford University with uh, Professor Surya Geguli, and I spent some time at Google Research and uh, DeepMind, and some of the papers I'll be talking about were done while there. And so this talk will be uh, based on several papers, uh, primarily that I've worked on in the past uh, with uh, some great colleagues of mine, and then uh, the links to the papers are listed below, uh, and their archive links uh, likewise. Okay, let's uh, just uh, jump straight in. Uh, the first paper I'll be discussing in this talk is uh, this deep learning versus kernel learning paper that I was lucky enough to work on with, uh, with uh, well, and there was myself and then Carolina uh, Mansich, uh, Sepede, Dan, and Surya. And uh, this was a paper we published last year at NERPS 2020. Uh, the second paper I uh, based a lot of this talk on is uh, a uh, large-scale structure of neural network loss landscapes that I uh, worked in with uh, Stanislav Jastrzewski, who was an intern at Google Brain at the time, and now he's a professor uh, in Poland. And the third paper I'll be looking at, uh, I was lucky enough to work on with Wei Yihu and Balaji Lakshmanarayanan. Uh, back then, they were at Google at uh, DeepMind, and um, now Balaji is at Google Brain. And in this paper, we looked at uh, deep ensembles and uh, the loss landscape perspective on ensembling and Bayesian techniques, and especially approximate Bayesian techniques. And there will be also elements of another paper in which we look at the applications of kind of loss landscape perspective uh, for a MIMO architecture, so multi-in, multi-out architectures, and uh, effectively training a small ensemble within a single network uh, in terms of performance. So I first would like to start uh, on the high level, uh, kind of the philosophical level of, uh, of uh, this task of deep learning understanding we are looking at, because I think uh, it's kind of good to look at uh, like why we do what we do and what is the, the outcomes we are expecting to see. And so my approach to deep learning uh, research is um, similar to what a natural scientist would do, but not with nature, but with uh, deep networks. So here, the object of study is different, but uh, kind of in detail, it's pretty similar to the way a, let's say, a physicist would approach uh, a question in physics. So let me just start uh, pretty broadly um, with this cartoonish picture of a, physic a physicist, uh, you know, the observer on the left-hand side, and a piece of nature the physicist would like to understand. So we've got an observer and a particular piece of nature that we would like to like develop theories about and uh, develop an understanding of. And then we make observations um, as, you know, as agents in the world, and we can do experiments if we're lucky enough to be able to touch or influence uh, the piece of nature we care about. And then as we can uh, see what the thing does as we poke it in different ways, we could take a stick or like throw a rock into the, this shore and the sea and the, and the waves there to see what happens. And as we do this, we develop a mental representation of what's going on. We develop a model of the reality with objects and their relationships. So we develop the ontology uh, of this problem. But of course, we know in physics in particular that the level we were looking at before is not the only level we could be analyzing the problem at. There's a whole abstraction ladder of lower and lower abstractions, deeper and deeper insights that we can be uh, going to. So we could unravel the, uh, the beach and the waves 
and uh, you know the the sand, and go deeper and look at a mechanistic picture where we've got uh, Newton's laws and kind of gears and and mechanical understanding of what's going on on that level. And we could go deeper still, and we could explain the whole thing using quantum mechanics and wave functions and Schrodinger's equation and unitary evolution and all these things we know do underpin uh, you know the upper levels uh, in physics. And we could go deeper still to some unknown theory that we currently do not know, but we uh, you know, potentially could discover later. So as you could see, that there, there was a bunch of uh, abstraction levels so we could be analyzing the problem on with different objects and different relationships between them and different predictive power uh, on different levels. And so uh, theoretically, when you have a philosophical commitment to uh, reductionism, uh, you do believe, or like the, the, the commitment um, will uh, boil down to you believing that a fundamental level, uh, from that level, from a deeper level, you'll be able to effectively derive everything that happens on the higher level, let's say from the quantum mechanics to the effective uh, description of the waves, the beach, uh, and the ocean. The problem is that this is super hard and practically impossible. Even though in principle you might believe this is possible, your commitment philosophically could be to reductionism and this you believe will work in principle. In practice, this is actually really hard to do because you have to traverse a lot of layers of the abstraction ladder and uh, uh, that's mathematically really hard. And there's a great essay written by B.W. Anderson, a Nobel Prize laureate in physics for condensed matter called More is Different that uh, in general describes uh, this problem that uh, many things interacting in, you know, even in simpler ways can lead to very complicated behavior. So you might be better off starting on the level of abstraction you care about and then developing new fundamental terms on that level that are not actually fundamental from the philosophical point of view, but might be the most suitable ways of describing what you're dealing with on that level of abstraction. And so um, with deep networks, and here's a kind of platonic representation of myself as an observer of a deep network, we know exactly what's going on on the deepest level. We literally know the graph and the weights and the biases and the way to transform any input to any output we would ever like. So we have a completely um, transparent view of the neural network and we literally know everything there is to know about it. So in that sense, we know the most fundamental level. We know literally everything. And so this makes it way easier than what you would do in neuroscience where you do not know the fundamental level. And yet, uh, more is different. And uh, knowing the fundamental theory doesn't mean practically uh, that I can predict the immersion behavior that happens when I pass, let's say, a picture of a tortoise into the network and it says a tortoise as a response. I know literally every weight, every bias, and I can emulate the process of taking the image and passing all the signals from all the pixels through the network and getting the bin corresponding to the class tortoise to be the highest, the argmax of the thing. And yet this could still be surprising to me despite the complete transparency of the thing on the deepest level. And so with that knowledge, uh, what I try to do in my research is understanding deep learning on the level on which it's interesting. I mean, you know, it's interesting on many levels, but to me, uh, the emergent uh, complicated behaviors on the high level of abstraction are the most interesting uh, things about it. And so I do observations and uh, many people you know, follow the same approach in the community. So we observe things, we do experiments on these networks, we remove weights, project weights in certain ways, break certain uh, things in certain ways, uh, you know, add noise to the data and see what happens. And we do experiments on these things and observe what happens. And, and the great advantage of working with deep networks rather than physics or, or nature or the brain is that you can do as many experiments as you want, as quickly as you want, and you've got absolute control over everything. And you can redo everything with you know, ab absolute replicability, uh, unlike, let's say, when you work with mice and you would like to study some uh, things about their DNA. So in, in a sense, the deep learning understanding as a scientific discipline or the science of deep learning is way simpler than other natural sciences that uh, follow a similar approach, because here you've got an absolute control over your system and your system is absolutely transparent on the lowest level. And yet there's many surprising behaviors uh, that uh, this research focuses on. Now, uh, back from philosophy, let me talk about a talk structure uh, in more kind of uh, fine detail. Um, first, I'll discuss some really surprising aspects uh, of the lost landscapes of practically useful and used deep neural networks. And uh, in particular, I describe three surprising simplicities and a geometric model that you can mentally have that kind of incorporates all these things together and give you a clearer picture of what these lost landscapes look like despite their very high dimensionality. Then I'll discuss uh, some geometric consequences uh, of this model for ensembling and approximate Bayesian techniques. And, in the third part of the lecture, if we have time, and uh, we'll see uh, how it goes. 
I'll describe the geometric consequences for the role of nonlinearity and nonlinearity in uh, deep neural networks in general and their behavior in the early epochs of trading. So let's uh, just uh, jump straight in. So what are we looking at as an object? Well, I'll be talking about classification in particular in this talk. So let's just uh, focus on that kind of a setup. And in a classification problem, you've got an image, which is just a grid of numbers uh, and uh, several channels going through a functional approximator neural network parameterized by a high dimensional vector uh, W that takes that image and maps it into a probability vector P. And then given the true, uh, the ground truth uh, class of that image, you can uh, get a scalar loss out that tells you how unhappy you are with uh, the prediction of the network. And my whole research has been kind of looking at different aspects of this uh, problem setup and analyzing how they connect together. So uh, my papers, kind of uh, my research, kind of focuses on connecting different elements of this big puzzle because it's a really big problem overall and trying to understand their little uh, kind of particular facets. Okay, and so one of the objects I'll be discussing a lot is the weight space. And the weight space is the connection between the high dimensional vector of weights and biases flattened into a longer row of numbers and the scalar loss. And you can visualize this as uh, you know, if the weight vector has a D dimensions, let's say a million, it'll, it's a million dimensional space with one more axis that's the accuracy or other loss. So it, you can literally visualize this as a um, landscape of hills and valleys. And in that landscape, uh, an initialization will be a particular point, a configuration of the network will be a particular point. And as you optimize, you're moving through this landscape, finding a solution. And you can look at the origin where all the weights are zero and you know, you've got these axes pointing to the side. So that's kind of the mental picture you should be working with. It's a landscape of hills and valleys in many dimensions. So that'll be very crucial. It's not as easy as a 2D. And the second uh, notion I'll be dealing with a lot is the function space notion. And so that's the connection between the weight vector and the probabilities output uh, by the network uh, given a certain input. So it's the mapping, not only to the aggregate statistic, which is the loss, it's a single scalar, but the detailed predictions of the network on the individual images. So that would be the function space picture I'll be talking about a lot. And uh, this is obvious to many, but it's good to reiterate that equal loss doesn't mean that the two functions that have the loss, uh, uh, that have the same loss are actually equal in their predictions. They can be uh, in aggregate, you know, equally well performing on the test set, let's say, so they can make the same number of mistakes in the same kind of way, but the mistakes can be placed on different images. So that would mean that the actual function is different, but its loss is the same. So equal loss doesn't mean it's the same function. Let me now go through uh, the surprising simplicities you can observe empirically about deep neural network loss landscapes in high dimensions. And I have to caveat everything I say here by saying, we look at particular models uh, that we care about and particular data sets we care about. Let's say a ResNet on CIFAR 100. But of course, the observations we make are only relevant as long as we stay within the limits of what we observed. We can maybe generalize beyond that, but all these things are pretty empirical. And there's a trade-off between how concrete you are and how limited in scope your, your statements are. So here we try to be pretty concrete which makes uh, the statements potentially, if we change architectures in the future completely, uh, maybe uh, you know, not applicable anymore, and we would have to redo the experiments. And a lot of the things here relate to high dimensional probability. And here's a great book that I quite enjoyed that is a great, good introduction to high dimensional probability by Roman Vershinin. So the three simplicities I'll be discussing will all pertain uh, to the lost landscape again. So on the left-hand side, you've got the origin of the weight space, and three axes, uh, three weights, in, uh, for, for example. And so what you're trying to hit is a manifold of good solutions in this weight space. So it's a, it's a, it's a sub-level set, let's say, of loss below a certain amount. And uh, there's, there'll be a, some area or some manifold of points that have a zero loss uh, exactly. And so when you start at an initialization and you optimize using your SGD or you know, some local optimizer or SGD with momentum or Adam, you're looking for the optimum in this manifold of solutions. And you can wiggle in these million dimensions and go and hit the optimum at some point. When you look at a linear path from the initialization to the optimum, you might expect that if the optimization path in the million dimensions had to bypass a certain bad area, let's say a high loss area along the way, the linear path would uh, uh, hit obstacles along the way. But if you actually look at the results uh, of the loss on the interpolation 
along the optimization path, it goes monotonically down as you would expect right here, but uh, so does the loss along the linear interpolation from the initialization to the optimum. And this is a really surprising thing. Let me just reiterate again how unusual this is. If you were to move uh, on its optimization path, you could wiggle around everything, every obstacle you would ever want. And given it's a million dimensional, let's say, uh, uh, space of weights, you could imagine that there would be some bad areas you would have to navigate around. Then the linear path should not be kind of nicely monotonically decreasing. The, the loss along it shouldn't be a nicely monotonically decreasing thing, but rather you would see bumps and it would be uh, very unusual. But if, if you actually look at the loss landscape on this cut in the space of weights, so on the right hand side, you've got uh, the initialization, which is the red dot on the left hand side. The cross is the optimum. And um, I added another point, which is the un another unrelated initialization. And there's the blue dot in the plot. You can see that the linear path is basically, and, and so the color on this plot is the, is the accuracy of the model. You can see that like, you can go from the initialization to the optimum nicely and glide into a big basin of good solutions. And what's even more unusual or more surprising to me is that you can go from an unrelated initialization too. It has nothing to do with the optimum uh, and also nicely glide monotonically into the optimum um, uh, that you found from the initialization one. So this is a very unusual thing, and it means that the density of bad things in the last landscape has to be uh, smaller than you know, the, 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 uh, the exponential growth in the number of dimensions, because you should uh, be able to meet them along the way on these random paths if they were kind of densely distributed around. But it doesn't seem to be the case. These things are surprisingly simple. And this has been first described, by the way, by, um, let me just see, um, in this paper I'm writing, uh, I'm mentioning right here by Ian Goodfellow in 2015. And recently, um, I was involved in a paper in which uh, we explored this question further. So the first observation was that there exist these long directions in which no obstacles exist along the way. And that's a surprising thing. And I was, it was actually one of the motivations why I went into this uh, specific subject uh, and tried to understand what's going on in these high dimensional lost landscapes. Now, the second really striking observation is that the basins you're trying to hit, the low loss basins are actually very high dimensional, which means they're really easy to hit on low uh, dimensional random projections in this space. So imagine you uh, make a, a random low dimensional projection, let's say a thousand dimensional green plane, including the initialization. It's a, it's a, a fine subspace, which is just a fancy way of saying it's a, it's a plane of a thousand dimensions, let's say uh, D dimensions, little D dimensions here. If you constrain your optimization to that plane alone, if the plane intersects with the manifold of good solutions, you'll be able to optimize well, even within the plane. If it doesn't intersect, you will not be able to optimize well. It turns out uh, that even very low dimensional random projections generically include good solutions uh, in them. So you can choose a random plane. And as long as the dimension of the plane is like above a certain very modest um, architecture and um, data set specific threshold, let's say 3000 for a CNN and CFAR 10, you'd be able to generically find a good solution even given this really strong constraint. And given that this is the case, you can kind of read off the dimension of the manifold you're trying to hit. And so if you look at high dimensional geometry, it basically works out to be the case that as long as the dimension of the plane you're cutting with and the manifold you're trying to cut through adds to at least the dimension of the full space, then uh, there's a generically existing, existent uh, intersection that you can kind of hit when optimizing in the constraint uh, plane. So you can read off the dimension of the manifold you're trying to hit. So if the dimension of the full space is a million, and the dimension of the cutting plane on which you're optimizing is only 3,000, let's say, the dimension of the target manifold, so the low loss manifold, must be, three, must be a million minus 3,000 um, uh, at least, which means you are reliably able to hit it. And so this is related to a thing called Gordon's escape theorem through a mesh, which is a mathematical result about intersections between a subset of points of certain dimensions and uh, linear subspaces that you can look up if you're interested in the details mathematically. And so what we can infer from this is that the manifolds we're trying to hit have many extremely long and flat directions along which the loss doesn't change all too much. So you can stay within the manifold really easily for a long time if you move in this space. And some small number of very sharp, uh, short directions that show as uh, very high eigenvalues in the Hessian of the loss there, uh, they are very crucial to get correctly. Otherwise, you leave the, uh, low, the low loss manifold, this blue smudge I have there. 
And so this has been uh, observed again in this paper called Measuring the Intrinsic Dimension of Objective Landscapes uh, from Uber AI Labs. That was uh, a really good paper. And there they measure this property. And then I, I in the follow-up paper, I looked at the geometric implications of that. Okay, so the second observation was that the basins are very high dimensional. So the targets of, uh, you know, the, the target weight configurations are uh, lying on manifolds of very high dimension. And now the third observation is like even uh, more unusual, I think. And it's the, the fact that basins are actually connected. And this was uh, simultaneously described in two papers that I'm mentioning uh, down here. And you can uh, look at it as well, they're good papers. And uh, the statement is as follows. You can optimize from initialization one to optimum one, lying in uh, the uh, basin, you know, the, the blue basin here, the, the basin of uh, blue solutions. And from a different unrelated initialization, you can go to a different unrelated optimum. And it works out to be the case that the initializations, if drawn randomly with zero mean uh, from some distributions under pretty generic uh, uh, conditions mathematically will end up being orthogonal to each other. And this orthogonality will stay with them through optimization. So the endpoints, the vectors corresponding to the optima, the optimum one and optimum two, will be roughly orthogonal because almost every pair of vectors in high dimensional spaces are orthogonal. And if they're not, there's probably something happening in them coordinating them. So that, that could be a smoking out of some interesting effect happening. And so it turns out that if you were to linearly interpolate uh, between the two optima, just like take weights you get to through from one initialization and the weights you get to uh, from another initialization. If you were to interpolate uh, linearly between these two things, you would see that the loss along the way uh, goes up and the accuracy along this path between the two optima goes down. So here I circled, it's a literal cut, uh, I think for a CIFAR 10 and a ResNet. You can see that the accuracy on this black path, the linear path between the two optima goes down quite a lot. But it turns out you can actually traverse between these optima on an optimized path that connects the two. And this is a really surprising thing. So you went from initialization one to optimum one, from initialization two to an unrelated optimum two, and yet they seem to be connectable on an optimized path. This is a really surprising observation. And generically, whenever we try a pair of optima, we find a connection between them. And the original two papers use pretty complex methods to find these connectors. And in the large-scale structure of neural network loss landscapes, follow up uh, I wrote with Stanislav Yastrzemski, we found a very simple technique to find these connectors uh, that um, can really cheaply find uh, these bridges between the, the basins of different optima. In this talk, I'll be talking a lot about loss landscape visualizations. And uh, just to reiterate, a plane, a 2D plane, is defined by three points. And so you know you could choose uh, three points in the weight space, uh, whatever the dimension of the weight space, and then this defines a plane. If you and that's one set of visualizations I'll be showing a lot. The second kind of visualizations will be the same thing, but one of the points will be at the origin, so at the place where all the weights and biases are zero. So those are the two type of cuts I'll be showing in this uh, uh, in this talk, and I'll be coloring. Uh, the insides of the triangle with, let's say, the loss or the accuracy along this section of the loss landscape. And there you obtain the, the mid positions in this triangle uh, will be obtained by you know, linearly combining the weights uh, for point 0.1, point 0.2, and point 0.3. So what we're looking at here is a real loss landscape cut uh, visualized. And so uh, I showed you uh, on the right-hand side a cartoon of what's going on. So the aqua, the, the light blue dot, is the origin where all the weights are zero. The two green points are optimum one and optimum two after 30 epochs of optimization. And they are the things defining this plane. And then the, the pink dots, the initializations, are the initializations corresponding to the two optima from which you started projected to this two-dimensional plane because they lie outside of the plane. So you can see that you started at the initialization, let's say the upper one, and went to the optimum, you know, you know, upwards. And the same uh, for the second initialization and the same second optimum on the right-hand side. First, notice how orthogonal they are, because they're pretty unrelated. And in high dimensional spaces, everything is orthogonal, you know, by default, almost, right? Uh, and um, the color I'm showing here is a training set accuracy on this section of the lost landscape. So you can see that these initializations started on the onset of a large basin of good solutions and glided into a really nice large area of good solutions, the dark green areas. And you can also see that if you walk linearly between the initializations, between the optima, I mean, 
uh, there is a bad area in the middle of bad accuracy along the way. So that's the, the statement I made about the linear connection between these optima having a bad spot in the middle. So you know this place, this point would be another point on this plane. And so the way you can visualize these loss uh, landscape, the, the, these low loss um, basins, is a bit of a pizza slice uh, shape. They look like a pizza slice because if you look, look here, uh, the direction away from the origin is a direction in which all the weights increase um, as you know uh, by a scale that increases as you go out. So the vector stays the same; it's just its size every scales by a factor of let's say alpha, and as long as your network, uh, uh, you know, doesn't have uh, you know scape connections and stuff. So, and then even even there, approximately, uh, the the result of that scaling of the vector of weights and biases in your network uh, will be that the logits uh, will grow in scale uh, for a given input. And logits growing in scale, provided that uh, the um, the argmax is already correct. So the answer is already in the correct bin in the classification task. This leads to a loss decrease. So neural networks using cross entropy a loss will eventually try to increase the size of the logits, the scale of the logits, to make sure the, the probabilities of the low bins go to zero and the probabilities of the high bin goes to one, uh, therefore decreasing the cross entropy loss. So this, this is what causes the pizza wedge-like uh, 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 shape. And you can see that uh, on the right-hand side, there is an actual slice of the loss landscape defined by three points. The initialization is the epoch zero, the, the ball. And then epoch one is a cross, and the star is epoch 10. And the color is accuracy. So you can see that from the initialization to the uh, cross, the epoch one, you kind of glide it into the uh, big, nice pizza slice uh, describing the large scale basin of good solutions. And then you moved within it. So that's kind of uh, the, the cartoon I show on the right hand side, as supported by the picture on the right hand side. And um, we discussed that uh, from the two initializations, you go to places that are pretty unrelated, but their loss is the same, or like you know, pretty good both. It turns out if you actually look at what predictions these two functions make, these predictions are quite unrelated. Uh, so um, here on the left-hand side, I'm visualizing the similarity on the same cut of the loss landscape of the functions defined on this plane uh, to the blue. Uh, you know, to the to one of the optima, the optimum one, the blue dot. And so you can see that the, the things nearby in the weight space of the optimum one are also similar in their predictions. So they are kind of bluer. So this basin around the blue optimum is more blue-like or optimum one-like in uh, in its predictions on the test set. So the, the thing showing here is the, uh, is the similarity of predictions in the test set. And on the right-hand side, the, the thing being shown is a similarity the optimum two uh, like predictions on the test set. And you can see that there is a basin around the optimum two, uh, the red dot, that has similar predictions, uh, but are, under, like, are not that similar to the other optimum, the blue, uh, the blue optimum here. So you can see that despite the loss being kind of equally good in both, the predictions actually were quite distinct. So, and this is important, and, and everyone knows this is the case, because otherwise ensembling wouldn't work. If the predictions were kind of equally um, if the predictions were the same, then combining multiple networks wouldn't lead to benefits in ensembling. So, you know, of course, this has to be the case. Otherwise, ensembling wouldn't work. And, and we know it works really well. And so just to reiterate, uh, the two basins to which you get from two random initializations are pretty similar in their loss, but are quite distinct in their predictions. So uh, the top row loss, so the weight, weight space picture, the bottom is the function space picture. So they're quite distinct in their predictions. And as I uh, alluded to before, you can kind of bend the, the thing inwards in the remaining d minus uh, two directions and or d minus one directions. And then you can connect the two optima together. So these plots are not actually flat. You know, they are stitched through uh, th these, uh, uh, these uh, dashed lines are kind of stitches along triangular segments that are bent in the 999 and 999 directions remaining. Uh, and you can see that you can linearly walk from one optimum to another. So it's kind of bent inwards to the screen. And you can see that despite the loss uh, being low along the way between these two optima, the actual predictions kind of are red-like or optimum one-like, optimum two-like towards the middle of the thing. And then you kind of skip and cross to the predictions that are similar to the optimum two, or optimum one, I guess I, I messed, uh, messed up the order. But um, uh, the point stands that 
despite you being able to connect the two optima or the two basins really well in terms of the loss being the same, actually, when you look at the predictions, the predictions are kind of similar to one until the middle and after the middle, it's uh, similar to the predictions uh, from the second basin. And this is an interesting point, right? So despite the two things kind of living in an interconnected mesh of connected optima, their predictions are quite distinct. Even along the connector, you can walk uh, from one to the other on. And so let me just uh, you know, give you a few takeaways from this uh, section. So in the loss landscape, there seems to be a very sparse population of low, low loss and or high loss uh, um, that the kind of the obstacles you're trying to avoid seem to be quite sparsely distributed in this uh, in this high dimensional uh, set uh, of things, and so that means there exist long directions along which you don't meet uh, many obstacles, uh, and and therefore uh, you can move uh, along those and monotonically decrease or increase your loss uh, as you go. So there are many directions along which you can just go and nothing happens in these uh, weight spaces uh, of big deep neural networks. The second cool observation is that the, loss, uh, the low loss basins are actually really high dimensional. And so that means, it means they are really easy to hit even on random low dimensional affine subspaces of the weights. And so this could be related to the, uh, the ability of us to um, sparsify networks or to the lottery ticket hypothesis where you zero out some axes or some weights and, and yet you're able to optimize well. So this is a really interesting uh, uh, kind of aspect of practical uh, loss landscapes in uh, high dimensions. And I guess the most striking thing is that the low loss basins are actually connected, but the connections are pretty hard to find at random. So you have to like sniff them out using optimization. And so a good mental model of this whole thing is a web of interconnected uh, high dimensional basins. So it's a bunch of basins that kind of touch each other along special directions, but these directions are hard to find at random. So that's uh, my mental model of the kind of interconnected web of um, low loss basins in neural networks. Okay. so. Um, Let's now look at uh, kind of the practical implications uh, of this for ensembling and, and Bayesian uh, techniques in particular. So ensembling is really important because it's one of the most reliable techniques to improve the performance of your network as uh, people, let's say working in a Kaggle competitions uh, would know well. And so uh, this mainly deals with the content of a paper I wrote with uh, Wei Yuhu and Balaji Lakshman Arayanan uh, called Deep Ensembles, a Lost Landscape Perspective. And so as you optimize from initialization one to the optimum corresponding to it on the path uh, using SGD or you know, Adam, if you look at the predictions along the way, and, um, and then you also look at the predictions in the neighborhood of the optimum you reach, and you do this uh, for a bunch of initializations, so three initializations, blue, uh, red, and green, you notice that as you optimize out, and this is a prediction space, t -SNE embedding, you can see that like as you go out, the predictions along the training trajectory are more similar to each other than the ones in between, than the other runs, the other initialization, initializations and the other optimization trajectories. And then as you start probing in the neighborhood of the optimum, you can see that you're sticking together with uh, the optimum you reached in the predictions. And you're not reaching uh, the other uh, kind of runs, the red or the green run uh, I'm showing here. So uh, the TLDR of this slide is that as you optimize, you kind of lock into a particular kind of predictions quite early on in training. And that, that lock-in is pretty specific to the initialization. And then you're sticking with it as you go and optimize out. So the kinds of predictions you make as you optimize out are pretty determined what you do at the beginning. And then when you uh, start probing in the neighborhood in the weight space around your optimum, the functions you get are quite correlated with the optimum you reached, and does not. Uh, and then these uh, kind of explorations in the weight space locally do not reach the level of diversity you would get if you actually went to the other branch, the other initialization, the other optimization trajectory in terms of predictions on the test set, let's say. And so um, just to reiterate, you can try a bunch of ways of exploring around the optimum in the weight space. And here I show four different ways of exploring around. Could be a random exploration. It could be using dropout uh, to you know, get the noise into your system. It could be fitting um, a Gaussian uh, to the lost landscape around you, around the optimum. And then what I'm showing on the right-hand side in the four plots is uh, the predictions you get around uh, these optima for the blue, green, and the red run. And you can see that those are actually not that distinct uh, from what you got 
at the optimum. They kind of cluster around the tips of these curves, and those are these the embeddings of the predictions. So to be more concrete, and uh, so this is a good way to kind of uh, pump your intuition, uh, but to actually get uh, numbers on this, let's look at uh, a thing that um, I call the, the diversity accuracy trade-off for neural networks. And so in this plot, we'll be uh, looking at uh, ResNet 20 on CIFAR 10. And on the x-axis, we'll, uh, we'll be plotting the test accuracy of a model. So here, the green uh, star is a model that gets roughly 90% accuracy on the test set. And then on the y-axis, we'll be plotting the similarity of another function to this green star function. So we have a reference function, this, uh, this one network. And it's 0 different from itself. So it lies on the y-axis at 0. And it's 90% accurate on the test set. So that's why it lies at 90% on the x-axis. And so we'll be adding other functions and comparing them uh, to this reference function here. And uh, one thing we could easily do is run this whole thing n times and get independent optimi optimized from independent initializations. And so these things are roughly equally accurate. So they, they live on the same position on the x-axis at 90%. And they're quite distinct uh, from the predictions of the green star um, solution. So you can see they're quite high on the y-axis, which is the difference or the diversity uh, from, the, from the reference green star function. Now, mathematically, you can kind of bound what the possible things uh, could be like. So there's like two curves describing the minimum and maximum difference given a certain accuracy uh, that you can mathematically expect. And those are just statements about if a function is 50% accurate and another function is 50% accurate on the test set, there'll be some expected overlap in their predictions because they have to be you know, making the same uh, you know, on the test set where they are accurate when they are actually predicting correctly. They have to answer a certain way. Otherwise, they're not correct. So this kind of limits your diversity given a certain accuracy. And so now let's compare this uh, ensemble of, a green, of red stars here that you reach from independent initializations and through independent optimization. Let's compare this to what you get when you optimize, uh, when you look around the neighborhood in the weight space of the green star solution. OK, so let's first start, first start with uh, randomly sampling in the weight space neighborhood of the green star. And you can see that the, more, the further you explore around the green star solution, the more diverse you get and the lower your accuracy. So you kind of explore more and more around. Uh, you're less and less optimized. And you get more and more diverse predictions because you insert certain noise into it. But you, you see these things lie on a pretty tight curve in the accuracy versus uh, diversity uh, plot. And more, more uh, importantly, this curve does not reach kind of this island of the independently initialized and optimized uh, red stars. You could say, well, this could be due to the random subspace being a bad method. So you can try dropout around the optimum you reached. Also, the same curve. You can try smarter things like a simple Gaussian fit uh, to the lost landscape around you and sampling from that posterior. Again, a similar result. So this, despite these uh, three ways of sampling or four ways of sampling in the neighborhood of your optimum in the weight space, these things did not reach this island of um, kind of independently initialized and optimized to optima, which are the red stars. That's an island of its own in this plot. And so to me, this shows that the independent optima and their population have a better accuracy to diversity trade-off than, than the local search uh, for functions around the tip of your optimization trajectory that, uh, you, uh, that you would get. The problem is that many uh, techniques, and you can reproduce the same thing for, for ImageNet, so it goes beyond uh, simple models and uh, simple networks. And uh, you see a very similar effect where the cluster of uh, diversity accuracy in, in that plot of the independently initialized and optimized to optima lies quite distinctly away from the, uh, the line that characterizes the local exploration in the weight space, weight space around your optimum. So, and you want that. You want the models to be accurate and diverse at the same time, which is the best thing to get for ensembling. So what you could do is uh, normally you would sample in the neighborhood uh, of your, uh, so, right, so you can get to, uh, from two initializations, you can get to two optima. And within these optima, local exploration would yield pretty similar functions, but, you know, more diverse functions than, than not. So normally, the simplest thing you could do is uh, just optimize from initialization one 
to optimum one, optimize from initialization two to optimum two, and then ensemble those things. So here it would be the, from the red mode and the blue mode, one sample and ensemble those. And that gives you a big benefit because the blue and the red are distinct basins with this, distinct mistakes they make. What you could do, which is a better technique, is that you could uh, sample from each mode better. So you can, you can sample multiple times. You could use SWAG or one of these techniques where you optimize um, for longer than you would normally do and then look at the history of your predictions of your uh, positions in the weight space. And, and this is an old result from um, a convex optimization. If you optimize at a finite learning rate, you can jump around and the middle of these jumps will be a better um, better guess for the optimum of that, uh, the well you're kind of you know, trying to navigate into. So here, if you do a multiple uh, sample thing for each uh, mode and then do the geometric average of, of that position, so the weight vectors just average them, those will be better functions on their own and then you can ensemble those. So this kind of, kind of gives you the best of both worlds. Local search will give you a better estimate of the, uh, the minimum of that mode and then these modes can be combined using an ensemble. And so, Given that we know uh, from the beginning of the talk that these optima are connected using these bridges or these connectors, shouldn't you expect that as you, you know, go from one initialization and reach one optimum, that like eventually if you keep exploring around, you will reach the other optimum as well? So this would be the dream of kind of uh, you know, Bayesian optimization. You would be able to characterize multiple very distinct modes in one training trajectory, and then you would be able to traverse, traverse this network of distinct um, a lost landscape basins. This would be really great, but practically what we see is that you go to a particular mode and you get stuck. And despite the existence of the connectivity, it doesn't seem to be practically used by the approximate algorithms we use for, for the sampling. So what people often do is they ramp up the learning rate and they jump out of this uh, basin basically entirely and then they reconverge to the next one. But ideally what you would like to do is you would like to kind of traverse the connectivity uh, of the of the lost landscape uh, that you could exploit. But practically, this, this doesn't seem to be the case. And the big reason for why this is not the case is that these connectors connecting these basins seem to be lower dimension than the basins themselves. And when you work out uh, kind of how likely you would be to go from one to the other, it works out to be a really low probability. So a random search that's not directed towards, you know, let's say the red mode in this particular case, will not discover this connector on its own uh, very easily. So this is a kind of sad news for the approximate techniques that you could hope could traverse this network of good solutions. But it's a, it's a challenge because we could potentially develop algorithms that are more targeted at you know, exploiting the connectivity of these basins in the lost landscape. So the takeaways from this section are uh, roughly that um, functions within the same low loss basin are more similar to each other in their predictions. They're more correlated. And what you would like to get is as decorrelated a set, a set of functions that as you can get while also each of them being quite accurate. So that's the ideal thing for your ensemble. So ideally we would like to get point estimates from different basins. And this is really easily achieved by having and independently initialized and optimized networks and ensemble uh, because due to the high dimensional geometry nature of the whole thing, the initializations are roughly orthogonal and they'll never go close to each other as, as you optimize because they just never find each other because in high dimensional spaces, you know, as you go out uh, in radius, uh, the volume increases so much like as, you know, R, or like the, the area increases as radius to the D minus one. Uh, so if a D is like a million, you'll never kind of get close together unless you push them together. So uh, the ideal way, and it's, it's a funny thing because we uh, kind of have known this for a long time, but the ideal way of getting independent samples seems to be kind of initializing again and optimizing again. So local techniques like dropout, lower rank Gaussian, and, and these things I showed you struggle to find the same solution diversity as ensembles because they explore the neighborhood of, uh, of your um, optimum within the one basin you're in. And uh, my hypothesis is that this is due to the underlying geometry of the low-loss basins. They have a hard time escaping it due to geometric reasons. So these techniques are great if you have a specific trade-off that you would like to deal with. Let's say you don't have memory or time but they don't, seem to, they don't seem to reach the same level of diversity while maintaining accuracy as kind of a simple ensemble does. I see that we have uh, another 12 minutes. Uh, so um, let's see, would it be better to maybe see this and go for questions? 
Yeah, we have a question here from Pedro Antonio. Uh, he asks, uh, how does stochasticity like dropout uh, affect the picture of that landscape you showed before with uh, a blue, red, and green uh, yeah. exploration? That's a really great question, by the way. Uh, thanks for asking. So the effect of dropout is, um, let me just go uh, to a position maybe here. Yeah, so the effect of dropout, uh, there's like two effects of dropout, I guess. One is that by choosing stochastically chosen masks and you know, zeroing out the rest of the thing, you're changing the underlying loss landscape. So it's, it's a different function you're optimizing in expectation. And then there's this other effect, which is uh, the noise you're inserting into the optimization using just like having a different mask every time you, uh, you iterate on the thing. So my, my um, intuition is that the second effect, the noise caused by dropout, is basically the same thing as, as always. So you've got different sources of noise, like batches are different. You know, they're finite size, uh, learning rate is finite, not, not um, infinitesimal. So that, that aspect of dropout seems to just be an additional source of noise. And then uh, the effect that changes the underlying loss landscape, that I'm not too sure about. I think it can have a big effect when you do it at initialization. So it could find a different basin. It could like kick you out in a way that you would, re you would converge to a different thing. Uh, but uh, as long as you're kind of deep into uh, optimization already, and that would be the next section I would be discussing uh, potentially later, there you have a lot of stability. And so um, this, change, this change you would be getting, I don't think would be kind of long-term impactful on your optimization. So um, I think, so TLDR, I think there would be a pretty significant effect initially in optimization, but later, uh, I don't think it's a good effect. Okay, thank you. No problem, thanks for asking. And OK, so let me just uh, go through uh, this section uh, pretty quickly and uh, just as a teaser. And then uh, you can ask me more at the question section. So there's a really interesting part of research in deep neural networks uh, on neural tangent kernels. And so we looked at their infinite width variance as well. And so the key, key question in this particular section is, uh, can we approximate the loss landscape by low order Taylor expansions? So even first order. And that's a really uh, you know, interesting question. And we discussed this uh, um, question and the resolution in this paper, deep learning versus kernel learning and empirical study of lost landscape geometry and the time evolution of the neural tangent kernel. And so just uh, to kind of set up the scene, um, when you're having a neural network, you have a function that gives you logits for some input X and some parameters uh, that specify the weights of uh, the network. And here in this particular case, I parameterize the weights by a weight vector zero plus a perturbation little w. And it'll be useful for the math later, but it's a map from you know, um, input uh, and parameter pair into the vector of logits. And so this will be useful for expansions later. And as you uh, can imagine, I'm, I'm writing this as w naught plus little w because I'll expand this whole thing using a Taylor expansion. And so this is just a usual thing uh, that you would do. You take, you have a constant term that does not depend on the changes in, you know, in the weights. Then you put a linear term that li reacts linearly to changes in the weights, a little w. Quadratic term that has a, the C here is a matrix and the two w's should be one on one side, the other one on the other side with a transpose. And as you go on, the coefficients, the, the D and E will be tensors of higher and higher order. And there'll be equivalently many copies of the w vector, the little w vector. So this is a, of Taylor expansion of the, of the network. So this is generically true, right? And it depends on where you expand around. So it depends on when you develop the expansion. So wh which point W naught you expand around. And the point W naught is a weight vector you expand around. And so in the neural tangent kernel uh, literature, what you're doing is expanding up to a linear term. So you only, remain, you only retain the constant term and the linear term here. So, uh, and so this would be kind of a linearization of the network and uh, would produce a kernel method. And it's a finite width version of the neural tangent kernel. And so the original network maps, you know, the, the, the uh, input X and the weights W naught plus little W into uh, logits using this function neural network, you know, the, the complicated neural network that you might have specified as your architecture. The linearized ver version is only producing the constant term that does not depend on the changes in weights and the linear term uh, depends only linearly in the changes uh, of weights. And so uh, this is a well-known fact, but just uh, 
uh, to cite this, if you do this expansion and you develop this linearized neural network model, the corresponding loss landscape will be quadratic. So it'll be actually a really nice thing. So it's uh, normally you've got this interconnected web of you know, interesting basins and their bridges between them and very complicated stuff we talked about before. If your network is only kind of constant term plus a linear term in, in logits, in weights, uh, the way you produce the logits, what you'll get is a single big quadratic basin that, uh, that is much easier to analyze. And so these coefficients A and B will end up being kind of the, these uh, coefficients describing the Hessian of that quadratic well. And so what you can do uh, here is you can expand the network at different stages of training. So you can expand it around some early point in optimization. And then the resulting thing you'll be getting is a quadratic approximation to the lost landscape. But that approximation done early will not work and will not fit uh, the lost landscape you actually have. If you do it later in training, it'll fit well. And that local approximation will be kind of sufficient uh, at mimicking the behavior of the fluid linear neural network. And so you could also do it at a random point and that you, know, that, uh, that you can do, but it won't uh, do anything for you. Uh, but if you expand the network even late, like slightly late into the training, just like Epoch 10, it'll already be good enough an approximation to the neural network that you'll be able to work with it basically as, as well as the full network itself. And... Um, we call this a data-dependent neural tension kernel because the data dependence appears as the W naught in the coefficient A, B, and C uh, description. Because there, you know, it depends on where you expand around. And the point in the weight space you expand around depends on the path you got there uh, through. And that thing was involving the data and you know, was using optimization. So that's what the data dependence here uh, uh, relates to. And the experiments we do is uh, we we uh, expand the network uh, to the linear order at some point in training, and we optimize twice from that point independently. And then we observe where these children runs end up. And it turns out if you expand early, they end up in distinct parts of the lost landscape. So this is a real section of the lost landscape on the right-hand side. They end up in different kind of you know, uh, parts of the lost landscape if you do it too early. But if you do it later, later in training, they end up in the same place. So they kind of gain stability. and um, it turns out uh, that the description you get from the linear model sufficiently into training describes the basin to which you'd be converging, you know, even with a nonlinear run. So the linear model is uh, sufficiently complex. And I think I'll have to skip a few slides because uh, we kind of started a bit later. Uh, but it turns out, you know, later in training, um, later in training, um, if you do the expansion, you kind of have enough information around that local point, and even the you know the, the constant and the linear term will be kind of informative enough about the full loss landscape around that point that you know that's basically as good as the fluid linear neural network. And I had to skip a bunch of things uh, because of time, uh, but what we looked at in the end was a thing we called the nonlinear advantage, which is how good the linear approximation to a model is compared to the fully nonlinear network if you develop it at a certain epoch if you expand it around a point in the weight space you reach through some number of training of uh, training epochs. And it turns out uh, this nonlinear advantage is very significant early in training. So if you expand your network to linear order or like you develop your kernel approximation early in training, that approximation will not be very good. It's, it's accuracy once you optimize it will not be very good. But if you do it even sufficiently uh, like you know, eight epochs into training, you'll have basically as good an approximation as the fully nonlinear network. So the nonlinear advantage that nonlinear networks seem to have kind of fizzles out quite soon uh, after the beginning of training. And it's probably quite crucial for the beginning of training, but later you're in a regime where you're already on the onset of a really big basin to which you're converging. And that thing basically looks locally, locally quadratic. So you don't need the fully nonlinear complications in your, in your network. So later in training, you're basically in a linear regime uh, based on our experiments uh, here on CIFAR 10 and CIFAR 100 with uh, a ResNets and the wide ResNets. So early in training, you know, nonlinear advantages are a really big deal, but later in training, uh, linearized training is basically as good as nonlinear training. So this was a really surprising observation uh, for us in this paper. Okay, I'm sorry for skipping a lot through this uh, last section, but I would point you to the paper I uh, mentioned there. And let me just, uh, you know, summarize uh, what uh, I've been trying to kind of convey in, in this talk. So understanding deep learning, uh, at least to me, it requires working on a, the, the right level of abstraction. And the right level on which things are kind of complicated and, and very surprising is, the, to me, the level of you know, 
predictions and images, uh, sentences, uh, so the high level descriptions. So, and the way this connects uh, to the weights and biases and graphs is pretty complicated. So understanding that connection is not trivial at all. So knowing all the weights and biases that does not mean you kind of understand uh, in a predictive way, the high level behavior, the emergent behavior of that system. So on that level, on the high level of abstraction, the geometry of the lost landscape uh, has some really surprising simplicities I didn't expect coming, you know, going into this uh, research uh, direction. And it turns out you can kind of put them together into a pretty uh, predictive uh, like model of the, of the lost landscape, a geometric model of the lost landscape. It seems that optimization quickly finds a basin to which it will converge. And uh, from that point on, it's basically behaving pretty simply. So it's be behaving in a way that even a linear model can approximate, even a kernel uh, model can approximate. And the nonlinearity in deep neural networks seems to be really crucial for locating the basin at the beginning of training, but later it becomes less important based on our experiments. And so the linearized neural networks I kind of skipped through at the end um, seem to perform equally well as long as you expand them you know, slightly into training. And as long as you let the nonlinear nature of neural networks kind of bridge uh, the, the perilous part from the initialization to like some pretty well-functioning state already. Okay, uh, thank you very much. And I think we can get to some questions. Uh, we, have, uh, we have no more questions, uh, but thanks for the amazing lectures and love. Uh, well, see you next time in the next uh, lecture from the Understanding Deep Learning lecture series. Thank you. Thank you very much. It was great. Uh, thanks.